Hi there, everyone. I'm Clark Cahill, Events Manager with the South China Morning Post. Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, Rebel City, Contemplating the Future of Hong Kong. Today I'll be interviewing our SCMP Deputy Executive Editor, Zoraida Ibrahim, who has been overseeing the protest coverage over the course of the last year. Also joining her in this conversation is our correspondent, Jeffy Lam, who has played a significant role in reporting on the protests live from the scene. Zoraida and Jeffy are also the editors of a book the SCMP has just released titled Rebel City, Hong Kong's Year of Water and Fire, which can be purchased online at our website, rebelcity.scmp.com, and at major bookshops in their physical stores, as well as online, including places like Amazon, Kobo, and Google Books. So we'll have some, some time uh, to discuss the book a bit later in this discussion, but to kick things off, uh, exactly a year ago today, the protest movement began in earnest on June 9th, uh, initially beginning with the goal of rejecting a proposed bill uh, that would have allowed for criminal extradition to the mainland, and then shifted into a, a larger anti-government stance in the quest for uh, universal suffrage. So, uh, Jeffy, to kick things off, uh, how has the movement changed over the course of the last year, and what have been some of its significant milestones? Yes, Clark, you're right, because like, by the time when Carrie Lam suspended the bill and eventually withdrew it in September, the whole protest has already been moved into a wider anti-government uh, movement. With, and since then, we have seen like increasingly violent clashes between the protesters and the police. And the first time, like, at the very beginning, protesters have been like hurling uh, projectiles and bricks and eventually petrol bombs. And same for the police, like they also escalated the use of weapons to water cannons or even life rounds later on. Then one of the turning, uh, turning point, I would say, is the uh, clashes at the Poly University in well, Polytechnic University in November. It was one of the most fierce clashes between the both sides. And then the police eventually decided to lay siege to the university, which eventually trapped around a thousand protesters inside. Like many of them belong to what we call the frontliners, like on the like really on the front line clashing with the police. And since then, after the battle, the quite um, the pro uh, the protest kind of like quiet down a bit, and eventually with the pandemic kicking in, like it basically halted the protest activities. And so in uh, written. In recent months, we have seen like there are signs of resurgence of the protests, like because uh, the situation has improved uh, on the COVID-19, and it was when the Beijing decided to drop a bombshell to announcing its plan to impose a national security law to Hong Kong. So now, like, yeah, things qu changed quite a, a lot o over the past few years. Sure. So there, I mean, there's been a lot of ebb and flows over mm -hmm. the course of the last year. And as you just mentioned, the COVID-19 situation yeah. put, uh, you know, a bit of a damper on it for a bit of a period. So now with, with the introduction of the law and everything, what at, at this current moment, what does the movement look like? Yeah, we've talked to protesters and we also talked to scholars, but like most of them are not too optimistic, like the movement can reach the intensity and scale as of last year. Like there are lot of reasons like the first of all like we still have the social distancing rule in Hong Kong in place and now the police has also adopted a more preemptive strategy meaning like they will stop you or even arrest you before people try to like group together and but th I think the most important factor is unlike the previous political controversies like that it was Beijing who initiate and impose the national security law to Hong Kong meaning like the Hong Kong government doesn't really have a role to play or have a lot of say. So, like many protesters are very pessimistic. Like they are not sure whether they can, like, even though like if a million people return to the street, they are not optimistic. It would change Beijing's mind. That, so that's why like they're kind of stuck in a state of helplessness and hopelessness. I see. So the protests have been covered. Uh, widely by international media outlets uh, at varying points over the course of the last year. Uh, what do you guys think it has been about these protests that's made them so noteworthy to a global audience and uh, what factors have allowed it to sustain itself over, over the course of the last year and in general uh, maintain uh, wide support uh, for many in the city? All right. Good morning, Clark. Good morning, Jeffy. Um, yeah, those are very good questions, but I think there are two questions there. One is about the global attention that the protests have attracted and whether or not uh, it, they have made a difference to other movements uh, globally. I think for the first question, I can think of at least three reasons. The first is about Hong Kong itself. Hong Kong, to many people, to many outsiders, is really a city that 
uh, a place where East meets West. It's a part of China and yet it's very international. So in many people's minds, Hong Kong is this a uh, very vibrant destination that they want to go and visit eventually or they have visited or they have friends and family here then to see hong kong in uh, a flame with the petrol bombs and the state of violence uh, that the protests uh, increasingly became towards the latter half of 2019 i think shocked a lot of people and that was one reason why i think it grabbed international attention and i think the second and third reasons have to do with of the composition of the movement as well as the nature of the movement. Um, on composition, I think uh, a movement that's uh, fronted by very young people, very smart young people who are in high school, universities, uh, becomes a very attractive proposition because you know youth are supposed to be idealistic and they're up against this um, regime up in the north that's uh, a communist authoritarian regime so these are all ingredients that make for a global story especially when that regime in question is a superpower in ascendance it's China it's China taking on the world it's China taking its place uh, on the international arena and then you have a population in this very restless city we called it in our book rebel city uh, 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 many many young people who are up against what they see as a very authoritarian regime and they want to resist that regime so just the co very composition of that movement it's like a David versus Goliath struggle so once you have that narrative going uh, it's a compelling story and that's how I think that's why I think it grabbed global attention and the third reason is that it's a movement that has many unique elements that could only have come about from the creative minds and ingenuity of Hong Kong people themselves um, when the movement first started uh, a lot of the communication or in fact almost all of the communication was via telegram and a lot of the organization coordination and planning of where to go how to how to make up your presence felt how to make a difference the posters you need to put up the slogans you need to chant were all done by consensus of course there were few influencers within those groups but they maintain this image of a seemingly leaderless movement. And that became another attractive proposition. Is it possible to have a movement that's leaderless? I think in actuality, it wasn't and it isn't. But I think the image that they've cultivated uh, made that a very attractive idea. And I think uh, a lot of scholars have started to study this concept of a leaderless movement. And I think at the core of this leaderless movement is the idea that if everybody is a leader and no one is a leader, everybody is replaceable, everybody is dispensable. So this is how you elude arrest, you elude capture, and you ensure that the movement can continue to sustain itself. And I think for these three reasons, uh, this is why, you know, for the past year, the second half of 2019 up to the turn of this year, uh, the world couldn't get enough of what was happening in Hong Kong. For us living here, um, sometimes it seemed far more dramatic when you see it on TV. Uh, in a way, we got inured to uh, the scenes of protests and violence, but uh, for the world, this was a very exciting story. But for us, it was a deeply personal story as well. Sure, sure. And, and just uh, to add on to that, uh, either Jeffy or Zoraida here, what, what factors do you think contributed to allow it to sustain itself for such a long time? You know, I think a lot of times when there's protest movements, uh, people think, oh, they'll, they'll wear themselves out, right? They'll mm -hmm. get tired. But that, that just didn't happen with this one. Why, why do you think that is? I think uh, apart from the leaderless point, like which Sarada has already talk, uh, uh, talked about, I think we, have to also, we also need to mention the unique unity between the radical protesters or, and also the peaceful protesters. Like, unlike other places in the world, like Hong Kong, like Hong Kong like, has for years been a fan of peaceful protest. And like, they don't easily embrace violence, but until last year, we changed everything. So like, we tried to talk to protesters from all sides. Like, like w why, why, why would there be such a change? Like, for the peaceful protesters, the, many of them, like middle-aged or moderate, 
Uh, yeah, and so they would say, like, oh, I'm like I have a family to raise and I have a career. I don't want to sacrifice too much. Like I can't do it on the front line, but like I'm, f they feel indebted to the front line young protesters who kind of sacrifice and the future, and yeah, uh, for the cause for the common cause. And so like this sense of backing also like reinforce the frontline protesters. They feel like, oh, whatever I do, I still got a majority, like a significant amount of people backing us. So this kind of unity keeps the movement going. And the protesters have also been like, think of different ways to sustain the movement. Like after November, last November, they realized like, like it's going to be a very long fight. Like they are, they're not able to, they're not going to achieve their goals in like a short period of time. And they also see a lot of their comrades being arrested. And so they have been, think of new ways such as like forming unions to consolidate the supporters in different trades. So we have seen like the sense of new unions forming. And they have also been um, developing a concept they call the yellow economic zone, meaning like uh, they will actively patronize and support the uh, restaurants or shops which uh, outspoken like which are like supporting the movement so I think these kind of different elements will ha have helped the movement to sustain I see so are, are there any observations that uh, might be able to be made uh, w having having a year uh, into this now uh, about the people of Hong Kong and its future uh, as a result of the impact from the protest movement. For example, around 40% of, of, of the nearly 9,000 mm -hmm. people that have been arrested have been uh, either students or, or within that age range of, of being a student. Uh, what factors drove young people to be a part of this in the first place? And, and what, does, what does that look like now? I think it also this question depends on who you ask. Like, if you ask the government, they would say, like, uh, apart from the um, aspiration for like greater democracy, it has to be deal with like also the deep seated problems in the society, like housing and uh, social mobility. Like they th they think like that contributed to the discontent. And some officials also blame it on peer pressure. Like they feel compelled to join the protest because like everybody around them are joining. But then like. When we talk to the young protesters, like um, the, many of them were too young to join the Occupy movement five years ago, and so this is the battle for them, like right now. And because after the Occupy, you can see like the kind of the social the social movement kind of like take a hit. Like everybody got frustrated, and so like even though there were a lot of control controversial bills being put forward, like no one really, sh not a lot of people really show up in the protest. And so when they see such a big amount of people going back to the streets. They see the protest last year as their once in the lifetime opportunity to fight for democracy. And like, as the movement goes on, lots of their friends, like really close friends, family members being arrested or injured in the protest. They also like, they feel they owe them. Like, we th they feel like they have to keep on the fight. And that's why you can see a lot of people, especially like we see a lot of secondary school students on the front line. Can I just add that uh, apart from the government's theory that uh, a lot of it has to do with social inequities, uh, income inequality, the lack of housing opportunity, the lack of uh, uh, clarity on the future that is driving young people, I think we should also discuss the, the possibility that um, at least in the eyes of uh, Beijing and the local government that there were foreign elements encouraging shepherding the movement. Uh, the problem for us is that we have not been able to find concrete evidence of uh, such a such a uh, situation. Uh, we would love to be able to find out more, but so far we have not been able to discover more. Um, so I think that is also one theory that should enter into the pot of you know possible theories as to why this movement could be sustained for so long. Uh, I'm not saying that it, it, that is the case, but I think we should be open to the possibility that uh, there were you know uh, forces or factors that contributed to sustaining the movement. Yeah. So, so well now now that you're kind of on the topic of, of covering uh, covering this situation. So I, I think our viewers would be quite interested if we uh, could pull back the curtain uh, a little bit and shed some light on our editorial thought process behind how we've covered these protests. Uh, from headlines to story angles, opinion pieces, how we cover it in social media, 
um, you know, there, there's certainly uh, been been scrutinization from the public on on how we cover it. So, um, you know, if you could tell us a bit about how the SCMP approaches this from an editorial standpoint, uh, and and how we approach it to to try to be as balanced as we possibly can with our coverage. Right. Um, that's a very important question. Um, as you know, if you live in this city, this has been a very uh, polarizing environment. Uh, people are deeply divided politically. And in Hong Kong, you know, you tend to identify yourself as either yellow or blue, or you try to be as neutral as you possibly can. Uh, for us at the newsroom, unlike many others who have been here to cover the protests, this is our home. For many of my colleagues, the streets where the protests took place, the buildings that they, uh, where you know, protesters attacked or police clashed with protesters, uh, are the sound and the, 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 the background, the physical background of what they grew up uh, against, right? So this is their sense of home. So it's a very personal story. Uh, it's very, very emotional uh, to see the, the places that you call your home being uh, affected in this manner. So we had to work very, very hard to pull ourselves together, to pull ourselves back, and to be very detached and clinical about the story, to stay true to the values of journalism that we think uh, has, have withstood the test of time. And that is to be fair, to be accurate, to be balanced, to allow all sides their say uh, in our reporting we take these mantras as very, very important values that we must uphold. Of course, in our editorials, in our commentaries, our columnists do take positions. And in our editorial, we also have some clear bottom lines. But apart from that, when it comes to reporting on the front lines, we are very, very clear that we stay neutral. We stay as unbiased as is humanly possible. Yeah. I see. And, and Jeffy, you know, you, yourself being uh, live on the scene, could you shed a bit uh, on, uh, A, how, how you cover things with, with a balanced approach, but also if, is, are there any uh, particular stories you, you wanted to share from your experience in, in covering the protests over the, the course of the last year? So, like, on your second question, I guess I have to say is the Yunlong attack on July 21st. So it was a Sunday. Like, there's a massive march on the Hong Kong Island. And at night, like, the protesters have been besieging Beijing's liaison office in Shenwen, and they vandalized the national emblem. So it was a very um, significant protest that night. So I think all of the reporters were on the Hong Kong Island. But also at the, around the same time at night, there are news um, suggesting online saying like, oh, there's actually a group of white clad men uh, stationing in Yunlong and trying to attack passengers and protesters who apparently returned from the earlier protest. So it was my day off and I didn't really catch up uh, um, with the protest on Hong Kong Island. But then like at night after I put my baby to bed, I checked Twitter and I saw like basically, oh, that's what happening in Yunlong, which is where I live. And so like, I checked with Suraida saying, like, oh, sh should I go? And she said, why not? And so <laughs> I just grabbed my helmet and like, my gear, and I just went down. So it was my very first time seeing a group of men trying to, like holding sticks and like rods, trying to attack people. Like, I saw them force open the shutters. And for the fir very first time, I feel my life is threat, like, uh, uh, is in risk, at risk. And like I saw blood stains on the floor, uh, broken stakes everywhere, and even like broken glasses. Like I was like, oh, that was the mall which I will take my baby, <laughs> or my, my seven, ten, seven month old baby, like every day. Like and I never imagined it would actually become a battlefield like this. And so like you talk about how to report object uh, objectively. I would say like whenever I put on my press vest, I'm very aware of my role as a journalist. Um, which is to set um, to record like what happened and to set the facts right. And there were some misconception like among a very few number of protesters. Like some of them, like I mean, very few of them thought like, oh, the journalists are on our side. Like they are with us against the police. And I think this kind of misconception is very unfortunate because in the on the other hand, it also fueled the misconception on the other side on the police believing like the journalists are, are not um, impartial. So I think like 
to me, as a journalist covering, sometimes I feel like I'm an observer to observe people <laughs> suffering, but like I, we're not really on like either side. I see. Well, I think this is probably a, a good time to call attention to our book, Rebel City, Hong Kong's <laughs> Year of Water <laughs> and Fire. Uh, it provides a look into the, the past <laughs> year of the protests. You know, I know the book is a, a large curation of the articles and, and items that we've published. Uh, and, and photographs as well over the course of the last year, but it includes much more content just beyond a curation of our of our articles. Uh, could you guys tell us a, a bit more about the book and, and why people might be interested to, to get a copy? Right, so this book is the embodiment of teamwork. This book, I believe, represents the best of SEMP when we come together. I think when we come together, our resources are substantial and the depth of talent is impressive whether it's the photographers whether it's our video team or the frontline reporters or even the copy editors in the office I think the last um, six to eight months I think we really poured our heart and soul into <laughs> reporting this story because as I said this is our home we feel very deeply for it uh, I have a line in the book which says that you know um, the scars of the city felt at times like our own scars. So this was how deeply affected and moved we were by what was happening. And I think nobody um, said no to doing this book. Uh, what we did was that because uh, the protests were taking place almost every weekend, and we were running live blogs that often ran into hours, like sometimes even 12 <laughs> hours a day, and so we decided that rather than have it stay in the ether, <laughs> let's put it all together and consolidate and uh, uh, use the, the last few months to, e to reflect and think back about what it was that we went through, what it was that the city went through, and to consolidate this into a decipherable form, hopefully. And we came up with 512 pages. Uh, it didn't start as ambitiously as a 500 page project. Uh, we were just going to put together the blogs and then we decided that, hey, we should go back to the different stakeholders whom we interviewed during the course of the protest to catch up with them to find out how their lives have changed. And so in the end, a lot of the materials that we put into the book were kind of um, Rep not just repurposed, but we added fresh uh, elements to, to the book. And I just want to share a very funny story. By the time the book f was nearly completed, we thought that, hey, we came across so many of these slogans that were in Cantonese, and we wanted the book to, uh, to reach a, a global audience. So we said, let's do a glossary, even though it may look a bit high schoolish, <laughs> but let's stick in a glossary. And the feedback that I got from people overseas was, hey, this is so useful. I finally can figure out what was going on on TV with all the slogans being chanted. So I, it, that's just a small anecdote to show that um, we, we have tried our best to kind of capture what the past one year has been like. And, and our publisher uh, was also very creative in suggesting when he found out that uh, you know our team was a comprehensive team that also involved our video team he said hey you guys have some great videos why don't we incorporate that into the book and so then we rushed to our video guys and we put together like the 15 of the best videos with a QR code so when you get the book you just point your phone to any of the 15 videos you you can have it in 3D. <laughs> sure, yeah. sure. Jeffy, anything you wanted to add uh, w as it pertains to the book? Yeah, I just want to add, like, it's not a yellow book or a blue book. Like, we try to include the voices from, like, across the spectrum. So, like, for instance, we have interviewed a top student, an uh, aspiring lawyer, uh, who, like, to explain why she decided to um, clash with the police on the front line. And we also talked to a policeman who lamented like how the social divide in the city has caused his like the social circle like the whole social network he has cultivated since high school and then there's also like a second generation tycoon talking about like how he sees like uh, Beijing's approach and to Hong Kong and many many so I think like we did not intend to break any new ground in this book but I think it's a really a comprehensive record of the Hong Kong protests which has changed the city forever. Sure, sure. 
Thanks. So I have a few more questions to ask uh, Zoraida and Jeffy, but we also want to hear from, from all of you who are watching. So uh, be sure to, to use the Q&A function uh, on, on the platform and submit uh, whatever you can uh, over the course of the next uh, 20, 30 minutes that we have left. Uh, and, and we'll try to get those questions uh, over to our uh, panelists here. Uh, so moving forward, uh, let's address uh, Beijing's proposed national security law, which has uh, been catalyzed by the, the protest movement over the course of the last year. And it's likely to be made official in, in probably just a few months' time. Uh, at this stage, uh, details are, are not, there's not much. Uh, but I know many are worried it could make a drastic change to the establishment of the notion of one country, two systems. Uh, despite there being a lack of, of concrete information out there, what can you tell us in, uh, about um, you know, what, what the latest is and what people are thinking? Right. I think, Clark, you're absolutely right to say that details are very sketchy. Um, when the NPC met, all they received was a, was a seven-point resolution that broadly outlined what the law could look like. I think it is in the details that we need to watch out for. And uh, though those details can come as early as the end of the month or in August because the NPC Standing Committee, which will pass the law, is due to meet. Uh, in June and in August. So these two months are going to be very interesting times to find out. But I think um, in the absence of details, the only thing that we can hang on to are the statements that have been made by state leaders. Uh, they have mentioned that uh, the crimes that this law will, will target uh, will be restricted to a very small minority of people. And the four crimes are uh, secession, subversion, terrorism, and foreign intervention. Um, they have pledged to cast the law very narrowly. So we will have to wait and see. But I also want to point out that I think uh, all the state leaders, especially the most recent one uh, yesterday, a Beijing official actually, a deputy director of the Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office, which oversees uh, the relationship between the city and the mainland, had a very comprehensive, very blunt and candid speech on how actually the national security law is to strengthen one country, two system. That was actually our biggest story yesterday. It's in our print edition. It's the main story in our print edition. Uh, for those who are interested in the national security law, I would really recommend reading that story because it goes into some great depth about why the law is needed from a historical context as well as the legal context. From the historical context, I thought it was interesting that he mentioned Deng Xiaoping and how when he, who was the architect of one country, two system, said that when there are destructive forces threatening Hong Kong, the central government has every right to intervene. I think that bottom line was set up very clearly in the late 80s, well before Hong Kong was handed back uh, to mainland China. So that's number one. And as to the legal context, uh, as I said, they've already said that it will be very, very restricted. We shall see. Uh, and I think Zhang Xiaoming, who spoke yesterday, said that uh, the law will uphold the rule of law in Hong Kong as we understand it, will respect the judiciary and mainland agents that operate in the city as needed by the new law will have to abide by the laws of Hong Kong. I think these are very important assurances that we have to hold Beijing to. Um, and beyond that, I think we just have to wait. But personally, I would think that um, the very success of Hong Kong has been pinned on the concept of one country, two systems. I think for Beijing to want to undermine the formula, it doesn't make sense. Why do you want to jeopardize the future of the city and, and put one country, two systems at risk? I, I, I would still say, let's wait for the law, the details of the law to be fleshed out. Right, right. So Hong Kong has, uh, you know, very important uh, elections coming up in September, the, the Legislative Council elections. Uh, could you guys give our viewers some background on why these particular elections have been generating quite a lot of interest and what the, the implications may be for the city? So like riding on the anti-government protest sentiment last year, 
the pro-democracy camp has scored a landslide victory in the district council elections in November, November like taking the majority of 17 out of 18 district councils and sweeping like almost 80% of the seats. It's a big victory in the sense that the election itself is seen as a referendum on whether you support the movement, support the protest. So like after the great success in November, the camp has actually planning to like score another victory in the upcoming electoral elections. They were so ambitious to come up with a plan called 35 plus, meaning to take the majority, to secure the majority of the seven, 70 uh, strong legislature. So like they, they believe that if they secure the majority in the LegCo, they would be able to block the bills and proposals put forward by the government in, in another way to, um, to pressure to, to pile up pressure on the government and to uh, address their demands. But then like with the new national security law with the red, new red line set, many now are actually uh, worrying whether they would be disqualified like for the remarks they have said or what they have done in before. Uh, before. And so now like um, they were very optimistic before, but now the mood has definitely changed, like worrying like in the end maybe they are not allowed to run in the race anyway. I, I just want to add though, I, I, I still think these are early days yet. Uh, we still have to wait for the law. I think of course the opposition want to create um, some sort of concern and fear to rally and galvanize the crowd. Uh, I, they have talked about uh, the possibility of mass disqualifications. I, I, I think it would be very, very dramatic if that happens and I think Beijing would want to tread carefully over that. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to cause such instability, I think. See. Okay, I, I think it's time we can uh, dive into some questions that have come from the audience now. So this, this first one here, uh, are the Hong Kong protests unique to the city or are they reflective of general anti-authoritarian trend among youth in Asia? anyone want to uh, <laughs> jump on <laughs> answering that <laughs> um, I would say there are many features of the Hong Kong protests that are unique to the city. Um, and I don't know whether they can be replicated uh, elsewhere. But the concerns are similar, I think, when you're fighting against a, an, uh, a government. Uh, the impulses are similar. So you can see that in, uh, in Indonesia, for example, and in Chile, some of them actually cited the Hong Kong protest experience and said that they were drawing lessons from it. Even in the recent protests in the US, we've had people saying that, hey, uh, do we need to gear up and, and you know, uh, put on uh, tear gas masks the way Hong Kong protesters have done? In that sense, there are certain similarities and learning points. But I think, um, and the broad uh, thrust of how this is a fight between the small guys against this big authority. I think that theme holds true of uh, many other countries, but I'm not sure the Hong Kong experience uh, can be replicated elsewhere. Sure. Yeah. So another question here is from uh, Jason Chiam. Uh, with the introduction of the security law, uh, how ha have you observed uh, the mood changing, you know, be it with uh, talking to anyone, people in the business community or, or you know, a anyone who, who's still uh, out protesting on the streets, perhaps. Uh, ha has the mood changed uh, since, since the introduction of this? So like talking about the business sector, I have talked to some uh, pro-business lawmakers and also some businessmen in Hong Kong. So like they were like, they don't think the sector would be as outspoken as they have been uh, when they up against the extradition bill last year. Probably because like last year they thought like the extradition bill would act, would really hit them. Like um, they, they might breach the law. They feel like it's a threat to them. And then, but this time they feel like, oh, national security is really nothing to do with me. Like they don't think they will be easily breaching the law. That's point one. And the other point is like um, after a year of protest and also hit by the pandemic, like they had a very difficult time doing business here in Hong Kong. And so like so, someone said like, um, when the pandemic situation improved, they thought, oh, that's finally, finally time for us to do business, to finally gain some money. But then like they saw the resurgence of protests and they, they were so like hopeless. And some of them feel like, oh, after a year, it's proven that the Hong Kong government itself with the police force, like they were not going to be able to quash the protest. 
at all. And so they feel like, oh, finally, Beijing's doing something. Perhaps it can end all the like um, conflicts here. Like it might be painful to Hong Kong in the short term, but in long term, it might help stabilize the business environment. That's like from some of the perspective. And on the protesters side, like uh, I have some diplomats or like some scholars sharing the observation with me, suggesting, oh, it was surprising. Like it's, it's surprising that the like the gov uh, the protesters didn't react as strongly as they should be. Like when Beijing imposed a national security law, like the streets are still quiet. Like there have been some sporadic protests, but like the crowd is not as huge. But as I said before, like there. Numerous factors contributing to this, like it's the social distancing rule and the, pol uh, the police more preemptive strategies, and now like they're really thinking like, do would we be able to change Beijing's mind even though we take to the streets? So, like this is the questions that they are asking themselves. Right. If I may just add, I think Hong Kong is a very resilient place. It has adjusted, it has adapted, because this is a place where commerce thrives. See. So another question here from Tom Mulvey. Uh, the new security law will target a few people. Who <laughs> might these few people be? So <laughs> I, like, I, I know, you know, I even some of Hong Kong's uh, government officials have, have even said themselves that, that protests actually uh, still will be allowed in the city. They, they've said that as long as it's, you know, maybe not a threat to national security. And so, uh, you know, what, what might this discrepancy be? And, and, you know, can you imagine, you know, what maybe some areas where you know, it might be okay to still uh, protest against. Oh, I, I firmly believe that I think even with the national security law, the right to protest is enshrined in the, in, in the basic yes. law. So I think Hong Kong people will still continue to go out onto the streets to march, to protest over issues they are unhappy with. But I think what will become clearer is that there are certain no-go areas. I think if you want to advocate for independence, if you want to uh, secede from mainland China, I think these are very clear red lines that you cannot cross. Uh, beyond that, I think we have to wait for the full details of the law. Mm. Okay. Uh, another question here, uh, this is from Vic Vic Dimagiba. Sorry if I <laughs> mispronounce your name there. Uh, What's the perception of Hong Kong residents who are not native to Hong Kong as it per has pertained to the protests? Have they been as active as, as local protesters? Um, I, think <laughs> <laughs> I think you have seen, I have seen um, non-Hong Kong residents taking part in the protests. You have seen them offering words of support. I don't know whether they are at the core of the protest movement, but I can see them or I have seen them being cheerleaders of the movement. Uh, does this constitute foreign interference? I don't know. But yes, I think uh, a lot of uh, the foreigners who are in the city have watched the protests and have been mm, largely sympathetic, I think, to the protesters. Okay, another question here, this is from Fly Lice. Uh, <laughs> it seems the government pro-establishment parties have given up on Hong Kong youth. Uh, <laughs> is there any room for conciliation? Now, I think you know, this kind of harkens back to a question I had, er, had asked previously, the notion that 40% you know, of, of those arrested have been you know, mm -hmm. s uh, of the student age. So you know, how, how can this bridge between young people in the city uh, with be it government officials or really anyone in a position of, of authority. Um, you know, ha have, have you talked to anyone or, or asked anyone about how these bridges may be able to, to you know, be repaired in, in the years to come? Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> I think those are the very questions people who sincerely want the city to improve for the better are asking. Have they arrived at the answers? I believe not. I think that's why we are here today. Um, do we need to get there? Absolutely. I think the future of the city depends on young people. The future trajectory of any progress that we can make um, to heal the divisions in society depends on young people. I, um, this is my personal view. I think uh, young people in Hong Kong are bright, creative, um, you know, sparks of uh, genius I often see. 
um, they are very engaged, um, but they also need role models. They also need leaders they can look up to. Um, I think there might be some scarcity there. And I say this in, uh, sincerely with no disrespect to the current leadership that we have in Hong Kong, in whatever sector, in government, in, in culture or whatever. I think the older uh, Hong Kongers are trying their best to understand the young people, but there is that divide and that divide must be bridged. And I think it would require many more engaged um, young adults to take the lead to, to carve a better future for Hong Kong. So a question here from Desmond Sue. Uh, Jeffy, maybe this one might <laughs> be a good one for you to answer. It seems journalists are much more active being in the middle during the Hong Kong protests compared with conflicts elsewhere. As a result, people claim journalists are influenced and even inciting what happens on the front lines. Uh, Jeffy, what, what do you what do you think about that question? Or how how would you answer that? So I think like um, I don't agree that we are trying to stand in between, like trying to meddle in the protest. But from my observation, I would say like this movement actually encouraged some like people to join the industry. Like, but some of them didn't like go through proper training. Like, they might be doing or like, have been working on other job or like they may be students. But then like they just like buy a press vest and put up and then like holding a camera and stand on the front line and they didn't receive any training. And I have seen some of them like misbehave, like maybe saying like chanting slogans or maybe like saying something something inappropriate. So as I said, like this development is uh, unfortunate because it it sends a signal to the police or some uh, sectors of the uh, of, of the society that like journalists are in like are not impartial like they are siding with the protesters or or someone else so but I believe like the majority of the journalists here in Hong Kong are professional they are only trying to be on the front line like risking their safety to record what's going on like um, um, yeah trying to set fa uh, facts right yeah uh, so this the oh I, I think we have time for one more question here, uh, and this comes from Amanda Yuk. Uh, how do you see the future of journalism? <laughs> it's a very, very simple, broad question there. So I, I guess uh, maybe if I could expand on that, uh, you know, it, with, with, with regard to, you know, again, we, we don't know much about the national security law, but and as Jeffy just said, you know, people have, have been inspired across the city to, to be almost amateur journalists. You know, what, how do you see the future of journalism, be it Hong Kong or, or globally in, in the midst of all this? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> the news cycle has become so frenetic that I think we're barely catching up with what's going on in the world. Uh, just in Hong Kong itself, when the protests were happening, we were wondering when was it all going to end because we were all badly short on sleep. Uh, we were like uh, social distancing from our families unwillingly. And then uh, just when things appeared to calm down, you had COVID-19. So it's been unrelenting. Uh, I can't think of a better time to be a journalist because there's so much to be covered. There's so much reporting <laughs> to be done. But I think there isn't a more dangerous time to be a journalist than now, not just for the physical dangers that are going to uh, happen to you, but also the danger of fake news, the danger of false information. The spread of information is so rapid these days that the spread of disinformation has become even faster. And that's what I think we have to guard against. Uh, we want to be fast and quick with the news, but we have to be responsible. Um, being fast is not as important as being right, I think. I see. Okay, well, Zoraida, Jeffy, thank you both so much for uh, you know sharing your experiences over the course of the last year. You know, I think our audience was very interested to, to hear your comments about this. So, so very much appreciate that. I uh, just want to call attention once more uh, to our book, uh, Rebel City. Uh, it can be purchased uh, through, through various uh, uh, organizations, be it Amazon, Google Books. Uh, you now see on your screen right there, if you scan the QR code, uh, th that'll also take you uh, straight to our website where you can purchase the book. Uh, again, and this is a look back at Hong Kong's most wrenching political crisis since its return to Chinese rule in 1997. 
So thank you both again, and thank you all for watching this. Uh, we, we really hope you enjoyed it and look forward to welcoming you to our next webinar.